Hello, uh, this is Mr. McNutt with a few final words regarding your test on Monday. Uh, I'm not going to tell you the exact question, so you're still going to have to prepare for both. Uh, what I would like to say is to make sure that when you prepare your potential responses, that those responses again have a strong thesis, and I cannot reiterate the fact that without a strong thesis and without this, what we call this roadmap to guide the reader and to guide you in terms of what you're going to write about, your paper probably will not be as effective. So please really concentrate on developing a, an opening paragraph that really um, shows direction. Uh, with regard to the first question, it's much broader than the second one, like I said. And so when you do this, um, make sure that you think of the bigger topics with regard to the results of World War I. Um, again, just to give you a hint, uh, one of the big results will be, of course, total war. And I think that's a good starting point uh, for this essay for everybody, actually. So um, just a hint on that, maybe a little bit of guidance. And then what you have to do is you have to select the other major themes and um, somehow categorize your information in such a way that it makes sense. And again, we've talked a lot about the different themes. We've talked about the... Um, economic changes, uh, the sort of the sense of disillusionment. We've talked about uh, the, the change in national boundaries would be one thing. We talked about the creation of the League of Nations. We've talked about the change in world power from Europe to the, the United States in particular. Uh, we talked about, we talked a little bit about social change as well. Um, the changing role of women, for example, would be one thing. Um, what, and so that might be something to mention, but uh, again, you only have 45 minutes, so you've got to choose which, um, which broader themes you can cover effectively. And of course, you want to talk about the, uh, the, the Treaty of, or uh, the Paris Peace Conference, I should say, as well. Although, again, with the first question, you're not going to talk about the Paris Peace Conference nearly as much as you would say in the second question, which, of course, is focused on the Paris Peace Conference. And so, again, make sure you conclude with something decent in terms of your um, final paragraph, that it kind of wraps up um, your main points, but also kind of gives something unique in terms of putting it all together at the end. And um, use the historiography as appropriate, but importantly, uh, make sure that there's um, you deal with those uh, uh, that sense of counterclaim, claim, ca claim, counterclaim. Uh, make sure that you're showing, um, putting things into context, that you're showing um, some cause and effect of uh, relationships. Um, and there'll be times when you maybe will do some compare and contrast. Um, depends on the issue, depends on um, the appropriateness. Just don't force things into your paper that don't fit either. And so that's what I'm, I'm trying to say. Don't don't be so mechanical that your paper is just a tick-off paper because some of those things that I talk about um, may or may not be more effective depending on the topic that you get. The second topic is the um, the Paris Peace Conference. Uh, again, just a little hint, I would start off with a good introduction, same sort of strategy that I um, that I mentioned regarding the first paper start off with something that gives you a road map that gives a thesis statement that's very effective in sort of leading the reader and for this particular essay I would start off with sort of this discussion of the war and ended. Wilson has this vision for the 14 with the 14 points this kind of peace without victory and use that as a starting point and then leap off into your other sort of themes um, Again, you're going to talk a lot about the Treaty of Versailles. You're going to talk a lot about the impact on Germany. You're going to talk a lot about um, how the major powers decided uh, to come up with the Treaty of Versailles. And again, one thing I think is important, it's um, whether it's partly ideal, not idealistic, or whatever, um, the, the Treaty of Versailles, as well as the other uh, peace treaties for that matter really reflected the real politics. You have these different countries with these differing objectives and what you're going to get in the end is um, a mixed bag with regard to the um, Paris Peace Conference. It's not anybody's real ideal situation. It's not Germany's, but neither is it France's or Britain's or the United States. So it's really again, um, 
it's hard to be idealistic when you've got people having different visions, I suppose. Uh, so keep that in mind. Also keep in mind the difference between the German anger and resentment, which um, was real, it was they really felt that, and the possibility that that may have been not necessarily an objective sort of feeling. Uh, again, most historians just today would argue that um, Germany was treated relatively... Um, was not treated too harshly with regard to the Treaty of Versailles um, compared to how it could have been treated. I mean, and again, the point being is that um, Germany was able to revive itself fairly quickly. And so um, that argument about this kind of Keynesian model argument that uh, Germany suffered irreparably, that it was permanently damaged, just doesn't make sense in some ways. Although, again, I think Keynes is a is an interesting point to start because it provides you with a counterclaim and then you can lead into your own sort of judgment about the economic impacts. Um, there's the other historians you might mention here if you're going to use historiography would be a, a AJP Taylor you know his sort of ideas regarding the Treaty of Versailles. Um, you could also use, uh, we talked about Gerhard Weinberg um, who said, who really challenges um, Keynes. Um, there's several other historians that challenge him as well, so um, go refer to the, um, the brief set of notes that I give you. Refer to page 49 to 67 in your Versailles and After book. Uh, that will provide you with some historiographical arguments for this topic as well. I, and again, I think the, um, the main idea here is that it, um, Again, it's complicated. I mean, in some ways, it seems like a total failure. In a way, it did fail. It didn't keep peace, obviously. And it did, the resentment did, in fact, allow, um, created conditions for Hitler to perhaps rise to power. I mean, that's one argument, at least. And um, so keep that in mind. But on the other hand, also remember there were attempts to, say, create a new world order through collective security, you know, the attempts with the League of Nations, the attempts to meet self-determination with regard to nationalism. Those weren't really successful in many ways, but I think on the other hand, we have to acknowledge perhaps to some extent they were at least attempts. And, um, so keep try to balance those issues a little bit when you discuss them. And so anyway, um, and remember, even though I say the focus is on Germany, remember there's other countries involved, there's other issues involved beyond just looking at the German, um, the German situation. So anyway, uh, that's just, I've talked about this a lot, but I just want to reiterate that. I want you to have this um, knowledge, this information to kind of guide you. And um, if you have any questions, uh, uh, please contact me ASAP before Monday. Okay, thank you.